Welcome to the church next door, guys. It's great to see you. I'm so excited to see you, to be with you, whether it's in this room, it's online or outside. Guys, you are precious to Jesus and you're precious to us. I'm excited to be singing, to, to strive after God with you, and it's going to be a great service. We've got some songs planned and we've got a message planned where we're just going to ask for God's will in our lives tonight. And uh, if this is your first time joining us, welcome. We want to say hello. We're excited to have you with us at any point during this service or even after, you can text the word uh, CONNECT to 614-412-2144. We'd love to get to know you. But right now, we're going to start with some singing, so let's stand up tonight and praise Jesus together.
and the way that you come for all that you've done and all that you'll do my heart pours out thank you you
our King. For we trust in our God, and through His unfailing love, we will not be shaken, we will not be shaken, we will not be shaken. Let's sing that again. For we trust in our God. And through his unfailing love, we will not be shaken, we will not be shaken, we will not be shaken.
knowing that you are more than sufficient, more than the battles we face, God. You're more than enough. Let's sing that bridge one more time. All those against him will fall, for our God is stronger. He can do all things. No higher name we can call, for Jesus is greater. We can do all things. We can do all things. We can do all things. Through Christ who strengthens me. We don't pretend that they aren't, that they don't exist, but God, we know that you are greater, that you are bigger, that you are stronger than the enemy that we face. God, I just ask right now, in this moment of surrender, God, would you just speak to our hearts? I thank you for this time that we have together. Jesus, you've brought us together even if we're online, God, you care about us, you love us. You're invested in us, God. Today, we take that next step into your kingdom and we do surrender ourselves to you, to your presence. Would you just show us and teach us and draw us a little bit closer today? We love you, God, we praise you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. All right, what an awesome time of worship. I love you guys. You can take a seat. Welcome to the church next door. My name is Addie, and if you're new, we would love to know that you're with us. Just text CONNECT to 614-412-2144 or fill out a Connect card that you can find at either guest welcome counter in the back of the sanctuary. And they'll have a gift for you just for stopping by. And be sure to check out our website at thechurchnextdoor.org. We have resources for the whole family to continue growing closer to God during this time of social distancing. If this is your first time joining us here or online, we want to let you know that we are so glad you have chosen to spend this weekend with us. Our mission at The Church Next Door is to help move people closer to God. Our regular weekend service times are on Saturday at 5 p.m. and Sunday at 10 a.m. You can join us at those times here inside the church or on Facebook Live. Or you can listen in your car on 87.9 FM as well. Throughout the Bible, God uses the symbolism of meals at a table as a way to show us how much he wants us to join in his intimate community. So we are inviting you to open your home for the next six weeks to what we are calling God Spots. God Spots are gatherings of just a few people in our homes for the purpose of watching our TV program on NBC4 or the weekend service and then discussing what God is doing in our lives. If you would like to be a host, just text the word GODSPOT to 614-412-2144. Together we'll see how God can use us in this season. Jesus said that in his kingdom, the greatest are the ones who serve. And serving does much more than provide for the needs of the church. Serving is actively participating in the body of Christ. In serving others, we go spiritually as well. Here at the church next door, there are lots of serving roles that take place behind the scenes. We have teams that operate video and lighting equipment for the weekend services. We have teams that prepare coffee, teams that help take care of the grounds and facility, teams that pray for people, teams that greet you when you arrive, teams that serve our kids and students, and lots more. If you're ready to take the next step and serve, just go to thechurchnextdoor.org and scroll down to serve. 
and we'll help you get started in a role that's right for you. Good evening once again, everyone. My name is Pastor Doug, if uh, you do not know me. And we are coming to that time in our service where we give our gifts and our offerings to our Creator God. Before we do that, though, I just want to tell you uh, uh, real quickly about something that happened with me and my family just a couple hours ago. We were driving uh, up the road here, and there was a line of trees, and some had, had turned orange, and some had turned yellow, and some were still green. And they were just beautiful, all these different colored trees in a row. And as we drove past them, I, I pointed that out to my nine-year-old daughter, Aubrey. And I said, Aubrey, that's an example of God and man working together to create beauty. And she said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, the trees come from God. He made those, and, and he made the soil, and he makes the leaves turn colors. But some person took those trees when they were little and planted them in that row, probably planned out the colors as well to create the beauty that we're seeing right now. So that's, that's God and man working together. And she said, oh. So, but that is what we have around us all the time. It's what God intended from the very uh, beginning of time where he created our forefather, Adam. He said, you rule. You take care of the raw materials that I've got. You make something beautiful out of these materials alongside of me. That's also what we do when we pray. It's what we do when we serve. It's what we do when we minister. It's what we do when we teach. And it's what we're doing right now when we give. We are putting our raw materials with God's raw materials, and we're seeing what beauty we can create out of them. So those of you who are here with us today, we have boxes throughout our sanctuary. If you would like to physically give your gift or offering, you can do so. Take an envelope, put it inside, drop it in the box. If uh, you're with us online or you just prefer to use the app, you can use the app, the website, the give buttons, very uh, clear there, very simple to use. However you prefer to do it, we encourage you to do that tonight to participate with God in this way, creating beauty with him. We're going to give thanks to our God for all that he has uh, given to us, particularly this opportunity right now. Then Pastor Doyle is going to come. He's going to bring us another great message this evening. Heavenly Father, I thank you for my family. I thank you for my church family. I thank you for this building and all the people who are in it, who are working together to do something beautiful in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. I thank you for the leaves and the trees, the way they're changing color at this time. I thank you for the promise that you are always with us and always taking care of us. Bless us as we give. May we create beauty together, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome. It's good to be together. Put your hands together. Just welcome those who are watching online. You know, you can wave at your neighbor. You know, it's a different world we live in, but it's a good time to know that we can be together. It's good to be with you online. Please say hello if you're watching online right now. You know, I believe that this is an important season of our life. This is an important season because you and I are being tested on what's most important. We get to evaluate our relationships. We get to evaluate the people that we love in our life and, and how do we care for them? How do we do life in a way that honors one another and honors God? How do you give God his rightful place? Well, that's why we're talking about the table. Because see, the table is this, this symbolism that God has used to gather his people and speak into their lives. Today, we want to talk about the table of feasts, okay? Now, I love the word feast because if I told you that you're going to come to my house and have a feast, you would immediately know there's going to be abundance. Just the idea of a feast indicates that there's going to be more than enough. I do not have to be afraid 
because I know that we're not going to run out. And what does that say about God and who God is? God is more than enough for us, okay? That God is able to take care of us. He's able to take care of every need we have physically, spiritually, emotionally. And the reason we gather around His table is to look to Him to be the God who supplies our need. And that encourages me because I need to know there's going to be enough for me. I need to know that I'm not alone. I need to know that I matter. I need to know that life is going to be okay. And in this season, we need that. And so every time you and I reach out to somebody, even if it's by text or Facebook or online right now, when we share with somebody, say, hey, you got to check this out. You need some encouragement because the world is pounding on us. The world is beating on us saying, you know, everything is bad, gloom and doom. It's dark. It's, it's not. No, I believe that there is hope, that there is a living hope, and it comes through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. All right, so tonight we're going to take some time and we're going to dive into the Word of God and we're going to look at these feasts. We're going to look at the feasts of God. I want to begin with this passage of Scripture from Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 9. It's talking about wisdom's table. Now that means that there, there can be an unwise table. And if you read through Proverbs, it'll tell you what the fool will do. It'll tell you what the sluggard will do. It'll tell you what the person who is not thinking clearly will do. But it also tells you what, what you need to do if you want to live rightly. That's why we have the book of Proverbs. It's there to feed into you and I. Now here it speaks of wisdom's table. And ladies, you can be happy because it connects you with wisdom. If your husband's sitting next to you, you look at him and say, I knew it all the time. That's right. All right. Verse 1, not as many women in the room did what I told them to do, but it's okay. I gave you an opening. All right. Verse 1, wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out her seven pillars. You realize that's work, right? To make a pillar out of, out of stone, to make that, that's not going to come. See, that's about diligent, isn't it? That's about detail. That's about thought. That's about hard work. That says that wisdom has built her house. She's hewn out her seven pillars. She has prepared her food. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her maidens. She calls from the tops of the heights of the city. So what does wisdom do? Wisdom says, I've prepared for you. I prepare for you, come and sit with me, sit with me and experience all that I have. And see, when it says that, that she's prepared the food and the wine, that means she's prepared the sustenance and the joy. This is what I want you to know, to live the wise life, to whiz, live the life of wisdom with God will always bring you a, a complete supply as well as a complete supply of of joy. And see, that's what so many people don't know. They think that somehow, if I follow God, I won't have enough. And if I follow God, I, it won't be any fun. And it's the exact opposite. See, what happens is you and I chase after the things of this world. And what it does is it leaves us empty. It leaves us lacking. And it leaves us confused. But God, what he does, he's, he provides all of our needs. He provides everything, and He always has enough to invite more people around the table. God is a God of invitation. See, if you and I give God our best, we can expect Him to give us His best. And see, those are, those are core principles to a Christian's way of life. You give God your best, and you expect Him to give you His best, because that's His nature. And it's your nature to give your best to God. God's kingdom, he's always inviting more people to the table. God is always making room for more people in the kingdom. When I was reading this passage and I was thinking about wisdom's table, it actually took me back to high school. Now, this will sound strange to you, but I went to a, a small high school. And they had certain core principles built into the high school because they wanted us 
to grow up in maturity. They wanted us to be wise. They had certain things they wanted us to be. One of the things that they wanted us to be was honest. So we had to take a pledge. I pledge my word of honor as a gentleman. And, and they would make us talk about our, our word of honor and our pledge because they wanted us to always be honest. And every time I took a test in school, I had to rewrite out my pledge that I'd be a man of honor, that I'd be a person of integrity, that I would not cheat, that I'd always do what is right. And it even they didn't say it this way, but that I would, I would confess if I had tried to cheat, that I would, I would get out in front of doing wrong. One of the other principles that they had was that every day when we had our lunch meal, we shared a common meal. You didn't bring your own lunch and open up your bag. And I know that's cool with you because you got to have ho-hos and peanut butter and jelly and you had fun things, okay? But I, we always had to eat what was prepared for us. And they always served our lunch family style. So you always sat at the table with eight people. And you had to sit with the same eight people for a complete semester. Because they wanted you to get to know eight people. And then as part of that process, you had to bring the food to the table for everybody. And you had to pass the food around. And you had to, to share the food, okay? And then someone had to clean up after lunch every day because they wanted us to learn to be servants. See, part of the reason that you have a table, the reason that you put the table together, the reason that you sit around the table is to create community, to do life together, to learn to serve one another, to be willing to be served. Now today we're talking about the feasts and we're talking about how God established these feasts in the life of his people. And the reason is he wanted us to create a rhythm to our life. He wanted us to establish our relationship with one another and with God. It's really important for you and I to remember that our relationship with God is not devoid of others. See, we have so focused, we have so focused in, in what I would call Western Christianity on a personal relationship with God. We've said, well, I have a personal relationship with God. What that means is that could be all that matters is my relationship between God. And that's not true. God always expects you and I to have a relationship with others. See, God created you to have a relationship with Him, but He also created you to have a relationship with others. But also, we need to keep in mind that a personal relationship with God does not mean He's my buddy. Now, I want to be clear on this. God may be my best friend, but He has more power than I do. And see, there's this, this familiarity that we have breeded in our culture in, in, in the personal relationship with God that has left us lacking. Because can I tell you, God and Doyle are not equals. And I know that. See, humility understands that He is God and I am not. That He has the right to judge me. He has the right to speak over me and direct me. And the reason God had his people sit around the table of feasts is to know that he is the provider, that he is the Lord of life. See, at the, at the table of feasts, you and I begin to imagine all of his glory, all of his majesty, all of his power. And it gives us an opportunity to repent. Because in our daily lives, we can become too familiar with the world. We can become too familiar with our own fleshly na nature. We can become too familiar with thinking that we deserve something. And see, when you sit at the table with the Lord, and He is a majestic, powerful, wonderful, loving God, but He is also the Lord that judges me. He is the Lord that looks over me. And I realize you and I live in a world that believes that God doesn't have the right to judge them. But you and I are followers of the great I am.
You and I are followers of the Prince of Peace. And the reason Jesus is so, so amazing, this is what he did. Jesus stepped down into our world. He walked among us and he sat at the table. And he reached in to God's Word, pulled out those feasts, and he began to connect them up to real living life for us to know that the Messiah, the great I Am, the Lord of life, could be born in a manger, walk among you, love you, but also give God a healthy way of judging your life. Because he judges you as one who's looked you in the eye, one who's done life with you, and one who cares for you. And see, that's why this is important. Have you got your notes? Because I want to show you five feasts that God gives us. And I want you to see the wisdom of God's table in the annual feast. Now, be clear on this. Under, under Mosaic law, under the, 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 the Mosaic law, they actually had seven feasts that they dealt with, okay? I'm going to show you three of those feasts, and then I'm going to show you two other feasts. And these are at least, I believe Jesus celebrated these five for sure. More than likely, Jesus celebrated all seven, but we, we, I can only show you what I know for sure, right? And, and we'll get there, all right? So first of all, let's talk about the annual feasts in, in, among God's people. And the reason, the reason that this is important is it emphasizes, see, it brings together the personal nature of God, but it does not separate Him from His majesty, His glory, His power, and His authority over your life. See, the danger that we have in, in, in loving a personal relationship with Jesus, and I want you to do that. I want you to know that you can share your heart with God. I want you to know that He listens to you, that He loves you, that you're valuable. Don't lose sight of that. But don't take away his authority, his power, his omniscience, his omnipresence, and, and all the majesty that comes with that. Because then he becomes like you in such a way that he's not powerful enough to save you, to deliver you, and provide for you. And that's why we have to be careful, okay? The first one I want you to look at here is listen to Leviticus 23.8. For seven days present a food offering to the Lord. Seven days. And on the seventh day, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. Can I tell you what I like about this? Is the seven days off. I love that idea. Wonder where we got the idea for a vacation. Hmm. See, God established among his people a regular time of just resting in His presence. See, God wants you to rest in His presence. Last Sunday night at Deeper Life, I spent the whole time just talking about the Sabbath. And if you haven't heard it, go and listen to it. Because this is why God wants you to have within the routine of your life, honoring of Him. That does not mean that you and I have to go back under the law and, and fulfill all the Jewish law. I didn't say that. What I'm saying is, are you in the regular habit of stopping and giving God room in your life on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, and on an annual basis? Because if you do that, what it does is it constantly cultivates the relationship, but it also cultivates the majesty. And the, and, the, and the beauty of the all-powerful living God. The first feast that I want to point out to you is the Passover feast. In the Passover feast, in a Jewish home, what you would do is you celebrated the exodus from Egypt, right? You know that because you've watched the Prince of Egypt, or you've watched Moses, right? And, and, you, and, you, and you've watched the story of the Ten Commandments. Well, that's what they were doing. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 7 and 8, it says, Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, 
Our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old bread, leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So what happened is if you grew up in a Jewish home and you knew Passover was coming, you would clean your house and you'd get rid of all the flour, all the yeast. You'd get rid of all of that symbolically because you wanted to remind yourself that although I live in this world, I'm not of this world. I'm relying on the blood of the Lamb being placed over the doorpost of my life as my deliverance and my Redeemer. And so we cleaned our house as a symbol of the fact that we need God to make us clean and that we need to go before Him as a clean people because He is a God who judges us, okay? Now, Jesus stepped into that, and He became our Passover lamb. And so in the New Testament, after Jesus had gone to the cross, the believers knew, well, we don't have to celebrate Passover the way we used to because we know the blood of the Lamb is on the doorpost of our life. His name is Jesus, the Messiah. But so what they would do is they would take this season and they'd say, you know, has any worldliness and anger and, and those, and they, they, would, they would begin to evaluate, has my life become something much less than is worthy of the Messiah? Do I need to go back and, and, and deal with that old nature and say no to it? Now think about that. Can you imagine spending a week of your life and just contemplating in the past 12 months? Has any ungodly behavior begun to crop up? Well, that's healthy, isn't it? Every Christian should do that. God, speak to my life. Now, we don't do that to be saved. We do that because we are saved, because He's redeemed us, and it's worthy of Him, okay? A second feast, now, now let me just say this, the Passover, Pentecost, and um, Tabernacles, or Sukkot, that those three, once all of us had to go to Jerusalem to present ourselves before the Lord if we had grown up under, under Judaism. It required pilgrimage, okay? So everyone had to participate in that, okay? And, and, and Pentecost was the celebration of of the harvest, what you and I would call the, the winter harvest that comes in springtime. Those of you that grew up in the suburbs and in the city, you have no idea what I'm talking about right now. I apologize. Let me explain really quickly. When you grow up on a farm, you understand that you plant seed and then it goes through the winter time and it grows up. We call it winter wheat. You call, it, you call these different products barley, and then, then they spring forth, and then in the springtime, okay, you harvest them. Then, after you've harvested that, you plant again, and then you get a fall harvest. There's two harvests. And, and when we celebrate uh, Pentecost and, and tabernacles, we're celebrating the harvest of God, the provision of God. And see, if, if twice a year you stop, think about this. We, we, God, you've provided the lamb. You've provided the food that I need. We're, well, we're looking to God as our source. And see, that's what God invites us to. And so Pentecost was a celebration of the harvest. Now, as Christians, we celebrate in Acts 2, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. So as believers in Jesus, we celebrate a harvest of souls, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit so that we can harvest souls. Now, this becomes important, a part of who we are. It's it's. That's called Shavuot in Hebrew, and it's a celebration that God is, is with us, okay, that He causes a harvest. Then the third one is Tabernacles, or Sukkot, and, and it's about the booths, okay? So in the fall, if you grew up in a Jewish home, you would celebrate this harvest time, but what you would do is you would create you like a temporary structure. 
I love it. In Jerusalem, you walk through the streets of Jerusalem and, and everybody's got like a little balcony or they've got a back patio and they put like a little awning that they make and they make it out of the, the, the branches of, of palm branches and, and trees. And this is why, because when you, when you look through, you see the light of the stars up above and you see that God is the one that is the Lord of life and the stars of the earth and he is caring for me. And, and you take this time every night, uh, you come out and have your dinner during the, the Feast of the Booths and you recognize God as your provision. Huh. That doesn't sound so bad, does it? See, what, what we need in every relationship. I was with a friend recently, and they were telling how they had just renewed their wedding vows. And they said, this is the fourth time in 40 years. I said, well, you guys seem to really be into this. They said, yeah. Every time we renew our wedding vows, it does something within us that we're still in the game. We're still working at it. We're still serving God. We're still loving each other. See, this is what the feasts are about. And what it does is this. In terms of your family, it passes it on down. Now, you and I, we can celebrate Thanksgiving. And we can celebrate Christmas. And we can celebrate Easter, and we can celebrate Memorial Day, and we can do them as just fun things with food, or we can celebrate them as, you know, as a believer in the living God, we want to routinely make sure we pass on to the generations to come that we are fully dependent on God, that we're truly relying on Him for all we need. See, there's something about consistency. There's something about repetition that, that gets within us and it establishes us. It strengthens us. Can I tell you this? After you do it for a while, it begins to give you something to look forward to. It gives you something that you're hoping for. And see, nothing can take that hope away from you. And see, that's why God was constantly leading his people through the feast. Purim, you may not even know about Purim because it's a Jewish festival. You know what's kind of fun about Purim? The kids today in Jerusalem, they dress up like we do on Halloween to celebrate Purim. They celebrate that God is the deliverer, that God delivered them from the evil man by the name of Haman. And see, that was a case of anti-Semitism. And see, it reminds them that God is going to protect them and care for them. And can I tell you, they've been through a lot. The scripture is not clear that Jesus celebrated Purim. But I do know this in, in John 5, 1, it says that Jesus went up to a feast in Jerusalem. It doesn't tell us what it was. It tells us the kind of the time of the year. And I think it's possible that that's where he celebrated Purim, okay? But the reason I want you to know about that is that you and I can have these festivals that are kind of part of our community that we don't have to be afraid of. Just keep honoring God, okay? Honor God. We don't celebrate Halloween because we're worshiping evil. What we do is we try to show love to our neighbor. We try to, to give them a little bit of light and encouragement. And I don't know, we're at church right now, so maybe if they're knocking on our door, we're okay. I don't know. Hanukkah, Hanukkah is the feast of, of, de of dedication. And many Christians don't know about this, but can I tell you that it's a great way for you to talk to your Jewish friends. Because Hanukkah is a celebration of the reestablishment of Jerusalem as the temple about 165 B.C. under Judah Maccabee. Long story short is they celebrate the fact that God caused the oil of dedication not to run out. And can I tell you my favorite my favorite is you celebrate Hanukkah by frying everything. And as a southern boy, I love fried food, okay? And, and in Jerusalem, they have fried donuts everywhere. But this is what I want you to know. You can light a candle during Hanukkah, and you can tell your neighbor, I celebrate the light of the world. And I want you to know, I believe that the light has come and that God is never going to run out in his supply for us. Why did Jesus celebrate 
all these festivals. Because Jesus came to the table for us. Jesus wanted to do life with you. And he wants you to sit at the table. And, and you and I, we can sit at the table with one another. And it will change our lives. And if we'll sit around it with the word of God opened, it will transform us. Jesus came to bring us together. In, in Luke 24, 44, it says, He said to them, This is what I told you while I, while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. So Jesus came to fulfill the word of God, and he came to connect us up to God and that word. And so when Jesus came, he lived out those things. It's why Jesus was baptized in water. See, Jesus wanted to pave a way for you and I. Now, listen, I'm going to do this really quickly because I've looked at the feasts in the Bible. There's a lot more times than what we talked about. There's a lot more times when God brings us to the table because he wants to sit with us. Because there's powerful social implications of the feast. The first one is refreshment. In Genesis 19.1, it tells us that the angel of the Lord, we talked about it last week, the angel of the Lord came to, to Abraham before he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, right? The angel shows up at Lot's door. And what does Lot do? Lot said, come in and have a meal with me. He prepares a feast for them. He's showing this exact same nature as his uncle Abraham, isn't he? He's showing the nature of God's people, that we welcome the stranger in. We welcome people in because we don't know if we might have an angel of the Lord there. See, you and I are constantly welcoming people. We invite people to the table with God. And what happened was this. Because he gave those people refreshment, huh, his family received salvation. See, you and I, we come because we want to we wanna give God's hope to the world. The second one is reconciliation. Refreshment, reconciliation. Think about this. Mm. Jacob works for his father-in-law Laban 21 years. The man never treated him right. He was always a scoundrel. And finally, he agrees with his wives, we got to go. And they leave town. And Laban chases him down. And you know, what, well, you know what Jacob does? He says, prepare a meal, and we're going to work this out with your dad. Now notice this. Someone can treat you wrong. You can forgive that individual. But it did not mean that they were going to have dinner forever after that. Because Laban went home, and they went on in a new direction. And sometimes you have to make reconciliation the way they did in Genesis but it does not mean that they had an ongoing Sunday brunch every week. And I think that's important. You can forgive somebody and still move on. Thirdly, you have reunion. In Genesis 43, we have the story of Joseph's brothers who come to Egypt. And he weeps before them. And they have treated them wrong, treated him wrong, okay? But in this time, there is forgiveness, but guess what? It becomes an ongoing relationship. You see, sometimes you and I have to go before the Lord and understand the forgiveness that He's bringing us through, and the table becomes an important part of this process of both reconciliation and also reunion, okay? And then the, the fourth one is restoration, and Jesus tells the story of the prodigal son. And we're going to look at that more in just a second. So I'm going, to, I'm going to come down to that one, okay? And then the last one is what I call reclining. I love this one because it says that Jesus reclined at the table while he was at um, Lazarus' table. A woman comes in and breaks this beautiful perfume oil over Jesus and anoints him for burial, right? It says Jesus is reclining at the table and she does this. And they begin to complain. Oh, that, could, that, 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 that could have been given to the poor. Jesus said, the poor you'll have with you always. She did this to bless me. And so that confuses us, doesn't it? Well, I thought we were supposed to always care for the poor. And Jesus says, sometimes there's even something more important than the poor. And that's ministry to the Lord. And you and I have to ask, Lord, 
What, what is it you want me to do right now? And see, at that reclining, they're just celebrating one another. It also says that Jesus reclined at the table. And what did he do? He served communion. And in just a moment, we're going to have communion. If you're watching online, go get your communion. Get you some cr- crackers and some juice. We'll be, we're going to do that in just a second. But I also believe that one day, we're going to recline at the table at the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven. And we're going to hear the testimonies of what God has done. We're going to celebrate all the good things of the kingdom. There's this, there's this power in sitting at the table with God, and He invites us to do that. Before we close, I want us to think about this reconciliation and restoration, because that's what communion is about, okay? Reconciliation, God, He offered a sacrifice on our behalf. Look at what it says in Genesis 31 when Jacob made reconciliation with Laban. He said, he offered a sacrifice there in the hill country and invited his relatives to a meal. After they had eaten, they spent the night there. Early the next morning, Laban kissed his grandchildren and his daughters and blessed them. Then he left and returned home. Now listen, what that tells us is this. All the angerness and the bitterness were over. We began to treat one another with dignity. Laban knew, Laban knew. He had treated Jacob wrong all those years. And he wasn't going to fight about that anymore. And Jacob knew, and and Leah and Rachel knew that too. That had come to an end. Now this is what I want you to know. When you and I receive communion, we're deciding to bring the fight with God to an end. If you've been fighting with God, we're going to receive communion. And I want you to stop fighting with God. The second principle is in Luke, and it talks about restoration. It says, when the prodigal came home, all right, it says, but the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. So when you and I receive communion, what we're doing is we're celebrating that we now, we get to wear a robe we don't deserve. We get to wear a ring that we don't deserve. We get to have a new life that we don't deserve. And so We come to this table to receive communion today because we recognize God has the right to judge me because of the condition of my life. But he says, no, I welcome you home. I'm going to treat you as my beautiful daughter, my beautiful son. I value you. In Matthew chapter 26, it tells us that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. Now what you have to see is that he did that in the midst of, of Judas who was betraying him. And he, in the midst of that, he told the disciples, you're still going to make mistakes. So Jesus gives this to you and I, knowing that we're not yet perfect. A lot of Christians, a lot of people, they want to come to know Christ when they get it all perfect. No. We come to know Christ knowing that he's more than enough. So those of you in the room, when you came in, there was a communion cup on your seat. I hope you've got your communion at home. I want to read this scripture to you. Matthew 26, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. So those of you in the room, you're going to struggle to get the wafer out without getting the juice, all right? So we're going to start with the wafer. Just hold it up as a testimony. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this wafer because it reminds us that you came fully in the flesh and we present it before you. Those of us in the room and those of us online and we say thank you for loving us enough to sit at the table with us. Bless this 
In the name of Jesus, we pray. Receive the body of Christ broken for you. Okay. Now try to open the cup without spilling it on yourself. And I'm going to try to read the passage without spilling the cup. All right. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he offered to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink of it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Lord, we thank you for this cup. It is the cup of our salvation. It's the cup of the covenant. And we just confess that you are Jesus the Messiah. Can you say that right now? Say, you are Jesus the Messiah. Thank you, Jesus. We receive this from you. In your name we pray. Amen. Receive Jesus' cup for you. Lord, we just thank you that you considered us worthy of the effort of stepping into our world and inviting us to the table. And God, thank you. We love you. We appreciate you. We honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank God for the feast he's given you. Bless you. You're blessed in the name of the Lord. I'm going to say goodbye to those of you that are watching online. I will see you later. And those of you in the room, Pastor Doug is coming. He has some instructions for you. I love you. I love you. You are worthy of a feast of the Lord. Amen. Hey guys, if you have enjoyed what you've been listening and been encouraged in your faith or somehow God has answered a prayer from being a part of uh, the church next door online, do me a favor, shoot me an email to pastor at tcnd.org. This pastor at tcnd.org. Or like me on Facebook, send me a message. God bless you. Have a great week. Hope to see you soon.